So let's go on and start off with the with the prayer first before we do that. Father, we thank you so much for everything you do for us. Um, thank you for the gorgeous morning we have here in the valley, Father, and that that whiteness, Father, of snow we received earlier in the week, and all this heavy frost and covers everything and makes it white and shiny. And Father, it's hard not to think about the future in that context, Father, and, and uh, the gift of your son and the, the remission of our sins, Father, and that whiteness that's restored in each one of us, Father, without blemish. And Father, we pray that you'll bless our discussions this morning as we talk about grace, Father, and, and how to live in grace and how to extend grace to others, Father, and and uh, I acknowledge the, the grace, Father, that you've extended to each of us. So we thank you so much for the gift of your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So you recall we've got uh, five weeks, so this is week two, uh, and we're going to spend talking about grace, uh, living in it, uh, being sustained by it, delighting in it, sharing it. And then last week, we started off talking about living in grace, and a lot of that was really recognizing um, all that God has done for us. So we're, you know, looking at the 23rd Psalm really as a way to kind of get us there. And so um, we uh, spent our time uh, last week on uh, the first uh, two and a half verses, and we're going to spend our time this morning uh, following up um, that and pick up the last half of verse three there. In Psalm 23. So if you want to be flipping over there, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So we talked last week about green pastures and the Lord being our shepherd and what restoring our souls might, might mean. And we're going to talk this morning about being led in paths of righteousness. Um, so these are all last week's slides we covered, but we went home with uh, or left our study last week with some homework um, to spend some time thinking about noticing all the things that God um, does for us, all the things he sets in motions and all the little graceful things that, that happen to us where everything lines up just, just perfectly. Um, and also to practice saying and feeling and meaning, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And practice being content with with uh, what happens and the way uh, the way things fall out and knowing that the Lord is in control of all those things. Anybody have any uh, time to do that? Have a little reflect on that a little bit and have any thoughts, um, any epiphanies during the week thinking about and observing uh, God in action in our lives? Okay, maybe we're not used to having homework. That's okay. Um, this week, we're going to talk about uh, grace for regrets, and we're going to talk about um, what that means for each one of us. Like I said, we're going to hit that last half of the verse three in the 23rd Psalm and talk about the, you know, what that really means for each one of us. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So... Um, going to kind of flip around a little bit and uh, look at a couple other psalms too. So we're going to look at Psalm 32 here for just a second and I'm going to read it to you and uh, because really uh, hard to think about any of these psalms without thinking about lots of them, thinking about David's life and kind of his perspective and what's driving, you know, what he's, what he's writing. Um, so think about this question as I'm reading this 30 second psalm david admits to doing something that we can all identify with what was it and how did that work out for him so psalm 32 here real quick think about um what david did that we're all tempted to do and how that worked out uh david writes blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered blessed is the man against whom the lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit for when i keep when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of the great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteousness, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So what did David do that we're all tempted to do, and how did that work out for him? Well, for a while he was silent and uh, a very unpleasant time for him as he's reflecting. Yeah, so he was quiet. What was he quiet about? It wasn't, I suppose. <laughs> so very... Sorry, go ahead, Christina. About his own sin. About his own sin. Yeah, this is written. He's talking about the time when um, he had had um, Uriah killed. And, um, and maybe before Nathan has come to him. So how does that how does that work out for him? So what's he, he's, he's hiding his sin is what he's doing. And I think that's something we're all we all speak for myself. It's uh, easy to fall into that. And I, I want to hide uh, my sin, certainly. Um, how did that work out for him? What does he say Not about well. that? His body was wasting away. Yeah, through his groaning all night long. It doesn't sound like it was going well, does it? Pretty uh, dramatic language he uses really there to describe that. Which I think is kind of interesting. Um, I guess David is prone to that a, a tiny bit. Um, using a little bit dramatic language. So why is our natural response then just like David's who knew better as much as anybody, um, why is our natural human response to sin to hide it? Because we know it's wrong. No, our sin is is wrong. It condemns us. And we're embarrassed by it in front of others and even in front of God. I think sometimes deep down, we don't really believe the truth that God, God has the power to cover our sin or that he will still love us in spite of our sin like we get trapped in thinking of it in human terms of how could he still love me if I'm so bad and I'll add a final th thought all those are excellent um, it's just going to be we think it's going to be so hard for us so difficult or almost impossible if our sin is known it it'll just make life harder is what we deceive ourselves with. Instead, it will free us. And I think sometimes we're not ready to change. Like we don't wanna to admit to it because if we admit to it, then we know we need to do something about it. And if we don't admit to it, we can pretend like it's not there and keep it going in the same bad habits and doing the same behaviors. Yeah, you read my mind, Christina. I, I feel like oftentimes there's a battle within us and we want to deny that it's, e part of us wants to deny that it's even sin and we are justifying it through various ways, but then another part of us, maybe the Holy Spirit working at us saying, no, that, that really is a sin. And we, we have to um, turn that battle over to the Lord somehow. 
Wow, those are all great answers. So how does hiding our sin make it harder for us to live in grace then? I think it haunts us. I know that when I do something wrong until I confess it, it's like, it's always right there at the back of my mind. It's definitely that. It's, it's, all, it's always there, right? Until we do something about it. I don't know if the making it harder for us to live in grace is the right way to say it. it it's to me it's it makes it impossible for us to live in grace if you're constantly hiding something you're not free you have no freedom at all and god's forgiveness operates through our own willingness to see our own sins, confess it, and repent of it, asking forgiveness. And that's the means by which we can live in grace. Good. Good thoughts. It seems like there's a couple other little parts of it, and we're thinking about this on a couple of levels. I mean, we're mostly talking about confessing our sins to the Lord. I think we could talk about this in the context of confessing it to others, too. But just in the context of confessing it to the Lord, I mean, we have so many examples um, in Scripture of folks that sin and then somehow think that they can or want to hide it from the Lord. I mean, it starts right off with Adam and Eve. You know, they immediately you know, are, are hiding from the Lord because they know they've done something they weren't supposed to. I mean, it just starts right off um, in the beginning and it doesn't get, um, it doesn't really get any better than that uh, um, for the rest of the story. But um, what about the, you know, the part of it that is, you know, as long as we're hiding it, who's, who's trying to deal with it then? I mean, we know it's we wrong. Are maybe, Go we ahead. Are and maybe it'd be good if we went ahead and, and wrote about it like David did. Yeah. Well, maybe so, because, you know, if, as long as we're hiding it, we're the only ones dealing with it, right? Yep. So we saw how that worked out for David. Do we think it's going to work out different for us? And maybe we haven't had anybody killed. You know, and maybe we haven't lost a, a child almost because of that sin, but still kind of interesting to think about that, you know, um, we're still trying to deal with it. We're still, as long as we're not confessing it, we're still, so it's, how does grace work if we are still not even acknowledging it, not confessing it to the Lord, not you know, there's a proverb in Proverbs 16, 25. It says, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. And I think that's what, you know, that's what this path is or whatever. You know, how would things have worked out for David if when Nathan called him on it, he had not confessed his sin and, and moved on from that? How would that story have gone differently? So what's I, guy's if, alternative? I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking if, if, if I bring the first three verses or four verses of this psalm into the present day in the world that we live in now, and just about everything in the world that we live in, not in the kingdom, but everything in the world that surrounds the kingdom. There's all kinds of powers trying to influence us, our thinking, our behavior. Uh, 
the constant bombardment of the media, the advertising world, uh, the the world that's out there to try and get your last dime for something, everything they pour at you all day long has a tendency to create an awful lot of anxiety and confusion in people's lives and a lot of harm and hurt. And it just dawned on me that these first few verses of Psalms is an excellent filter for living in all of that mess that's on bombarding us all the time. That instead of letting all these outside influences sway us, that if we're just simply looking to the Lord to guide us in everything and restore our sanity, if you will, in this crazy world, uh, it's an excellent filter for how to just go through every day. And if you, you can ignore everything that can make you so anxious and find total peace just in those verses. Just kind of the way it struck me. Good, Don. I like that. Other comments on that? Or um, we've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, God's alternative to hiding our sin. You know, what did David do? How did that work out for him? What does that tell us about how we should be dealing with the sin in our lives then? In the Celebrate Recovery Program that we're working on, the first thing they say is to realize that we're in a state of denial. In order to get past that and move on to recovery, you need to recognize your problem with denial. And part of that searching of a peaceful mind that Don was talking about and admitting our denial is to, one of the God's alternatives is to confess our sins to one another approaching this like any other big problem in our life alone um, is extremely difficult but if we can get over our resistance of sharing and confessing our sins to one another it becomes a much easier process because the help is readily at hand if we confess our sins to the right individual They will not be a hindrance to the healing, but a but a great assistance to it. What I'm hearing here is uh, both uh, confessing our sins to God, but also making our sin somehow known to one another, so that we can uh, gain strength from prayers as well as uh, healing from God. You know, there's some pretty powerful stuff out there. There's a, a writer, Renee Brown, who does a lot of uh, research on shame. And, you know, we talked about one of the reasons why we hide, you know, our sins is because we feel shame about those. And I can't get the quote exactly right, but she says, you know, shame, you know, loves to be hidden or whatever. And as long as we can't speak about it, and as long as we can't admit it and kind of Um, acknowledge that or whatever that it has crazy power of our lives and makes us do all kinds of of silly things and she's really talking about you know this the shame and the sin are kind of all she's not thinking particularly about sinful events necessarily but just the con but the context is still the same as long as we're hiding it um it has great power for us and if we can't find some way to acknowledge that and and find somebody that we can talk to about that and um, and release those things and let go of that shame. Then we then it has great power over us and it dri- and drives every way we interact on all kinds of other things. Um, I didn't do justice to her to her stuff really, but um, pretty powerful to think about. And I think that's the same idea here. Really, this this sin had crazy power over David. If you think about it, until Nathan called him out on it, 
and he acknowledged it and moved forward. And you know, he was a good enough man that he was feeling shame about what he had done. He couldn't possibly have felt good about what he had done with Bathsheba or with having Uriah killed. He's bound to have felt shame over that and wanted to hide that. Um, and the, all of his actions, having Uriah killed basically was hiding his sin with, with Bathsheba. So he's feeling that shame and he's doing all kinds of bad things basically then because of that shame. Um, and shame really hates to be exposed. It loves those dark little corners. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't want, doesn't want, it doesn't ever want to see daylight. It, it's also interesting to me to think about um, the really the power of confession. And in some ways you could make an argument. Um, I mean, we have to be careful. It's a bit of a slippery slope, but to some extent where David really strayed here, the worst was not confessing this sin to God. I mean, God wasn't as angry with him about the sin as he was the fact that he wasn't confessing the sin or whatever and wasn't turning away, admitting that sin and wasn't moving away from that sin. Wasn't acknowledging it, was rationalizing it. Thoughts on any of that before we move on? Yeah, this is Annette. Um, you said something interesting, John, that before uh, we confess or David confessed that um, we're, who who is dealing with the sin or, or something along those lines that we are, we are dealing with it. But I, I also wonder if it's not just us, but we could be opening ourselves up to spiritual forces um, that we unknowingly are choosing to partner with um, and that are tempting us uh, not only to remain blinded to our sin and in denial, but um, you know, accepting it as being okay, and then uh, getting into other sinful, taking other steps, you know, and down that sinful path and into other things. And I'm, um, I know there's the verse that talks about, you know, first the eye sees it, and then, you know, there's that whole uh, path of progression and sin. And I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the screw tape letters as well. And just that that there is that power um, from the enemy, you know, trying to get us away from confessing and getting a, you know, keeping us on the path of sin. This follows right along with the Celebrate Recovery Program and the steps they take. And, and part of that is writing down the difficulty you have with your, whatever kind of addiction or hang up or hurt you have and so, you know, as we get into this, it really resembles the way to grace through the Celebrate Recovery Program. Good, good comments. Um, so I'm gonna keep us moving here just a little bit. Um, so based on Psalm 23b, which is that last, you know, the last little bit of, of, of uh, Psalm 23, verse 3b, sorry, the last half of verse 3 there that we uh, we started off with. And then the passage I read from Psalm 32, how does God want to lead us toward righteousness? And I'll read those things for you again. We'll think about that. How does God want to lead us towards righteousness? So Psalm 23, you know, the last part of verse 3 says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then you might not have caught it, but in Psalm 32, in that longer passage I read, David writes in verse uh, eight, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And this is like the word speaking. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout joy to all you upright in heart. So how does how does God want to lead us towards righteousness? One way is that he wants us to acknowledge the truth of his word. 
That's uh, the record that he's left with his relationship with man. There are tremendous lessons for us and we should be in it and it should be in us. So acknowledge it, yeah, that's good. What are we doing when we acknowledge it then? We receive it, then we trust it, and then we act on it. The action on the word is is <clears throat> our willingness to submit. Uh, you know, th this whole thing is about someone that has been submitting or is submitting and, and is willing to be led. Uh, and, and you don't walk paths of righteousness uh, in rebellion. And so God's asking, or, God, or David's stating here that God expects us to submit and be led and not be in rebellion and, and rejection of, of his uh, grace. Right, it says uh, he leads me. It doesn't say he drags me. <laughs> so he even says there in verse nine, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle. He wants us to submit. He wants us to acknowledge our sin and lay it before him and accept his gift of grace, right? It's there, he, but he wants us to choose it. He doesn't want to force us. It's every, like everything else about our relationship with God. He wants us to choose that. He doesn't want a bunch of you know robots or automatons or whatever that are forced to do whatever he wants to do exactly. He wants us to choose to love him with our own free will and choose to submit to him and have a relationship with him and have him help us deal with, uh, deal with our sins. He doesn't want us to be perfect. He knows we're not perfect, but he wants us to acknowledge our sin or whatever and accept our, his gift of grace to us to cover those sins, to wash away those sins. Seems like, John, a couple of things happen here. One is our bones stop wasting away. Uh, so we have that peace where and contentment, we're uh, but also the last half of that verse in Psalm 23 is that it's for God's name's sake. So God is glorified when we do this. Um, and if my motivation uh, when I get up in the morning is God, may I glorify you today. Um, part of that is to uh, be honest about my my sin life and to be honest about uh, whether I'm at peace with myself or not and if I'm not to investigate within my heart whether um, I'm hiding something maybe I am maybe I'm not but at least I need to ask that question but in the end I want my motivation part of my motivation not to just be for my own good but for God's name to be glorified and if I'm hiding my sin and God is being put in a bad light because of that that's an awful thing god wants us to be perfect but we're not So other thoughts? I have one other kind of follow-up question. I, I think it's important, John, you, you said, you, you know, when you need to accept his grace. This story of David and Bathsheba strikes me in that, I mean, David was in agony until he was confronted by Nathan, and then he, he realizes the weight of his sin, um, and then he's he agonizes and then the baby dies and it always struck me odd how he the baby dies and then he just gets up and eats something and goes about his day um, or his life kind of like nothing ever happened um, and I think that's a good example I mean it's so often we like to languish in in our sin and what we've done wrong and um, and I, I think it's important not to forget it and go down that road, but we do need to accept that grace and forgive ourselves and move on. I think that's good, Sean. And we're going to talk, I think in my next question or next slide, kind of hit on that a little bit. I think that's good. I like what you said too, uh, Scott, and we're going to talk about that if we get there a little bit too. Um, 
I do want to ask one other little follow-up question, though. Given that the great love that God has shown for us and this grace that we all believe, I honestly think we all believe that grace is out there waiting for us to wash away our sins, then why do we have so much time, so such a hard time letting him lead us? Why do we resist that? Why do we have struggle with, you know, confessing those sins to him and acknowledging those, those sins? Why is that such a struggle for some of us? And probably all of us, at least at some times. Maybe that's more rhetorical. I don't know. Well, I think it's a practical question and God identifies the two great stumbling blocks of mankind are pride and selfishness. Part of our difficulty is in the flesh is that our flesh does not want to give up control. So we resist handing all control over to God. So submission is still our greatest struggle. Mm -hmm. Probably so. Um, so let's think about this a little more and maybe tie in with what Sean was saying. But I want to read you the 51st Psalm a little bit and think about this question here at the end. What you know, we uh, we tend to want to either uh, try to earn our forgiveness, and you see that a whole lot, you know, like we think somehow we can handle it, you know, we're going to change, we're going to kind of earn our forgiveness, we're going to manage to turn away from that sin, but we're going to kind of not really ask God or let God help us with that, or we, you know, it's at times sort of grovel in despair and hopelessness, and we can't forgive ourselves, we feel, um, we feel shame, and shame um, is not a powerful motivation to change. To change, really, more of a power, uh, leads more to groveling and despair and hopelessness than it does um, really dealing with something. Admitting our guilt and admitting that we've done things wrong, but we're not um, we're not somebody that God doesn't love or that's unlovable by God. Um, that's a different place to be. So think about what, as I read Psalm 51, then what about God makes either one of those responses, either thinking we can earn our, um, earn forgiveness, or that somehow um, we can't and we're hopeless and we're, we're so broken, God can't do anything with us. Think about that in the context of Psalm 51 as I, as I read it here a little bit for you. It's not, not too terribly long. What about God makes either one of those responses uh, kind of ridiculous? So uh, David writes in the 51st Psalm, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Forgive me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold with me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, and then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So what about, you know, reading that and what David writes there? Why is then, you know, trying to earn our, our uh, forgiveness 
or groveling in despair and hopelessness, um, kind of a wrong response given what David says about God. It says all God wants is a humbled heart, <clears throat> a broken spirit and a humbled heart or a contrite heart, depending on your translation. Right. Talks about his steadfast love, right? And his abundant mercy. And his ability to blot out all of our wrongs, right? It doesn't talk about our ability to ever blot out all of our wrongs. There's nothing I can ever do to be good enough to blot out all the things that I've done wrong or stop doing more things wrong. Yeah, so, I think you said something very important right there is, is only God can forgive sins. Only God has the power to overcome sin. Um, and if we think we can overcome it under our own power to earn forgiveness, um, we're deceiving ourselves. But we have to understand only God has that power over sin. Which is one more reason why it makes no sense at all for us to keep it all to ourselves and hide, to hide it from God and think somehow anything good comes of that, right? So then what's our responsibility and what's God's responsibility when it comes to forgiveness of our sins? Put it kind of a real practical way. Well, we can't hide our sins from God, so our responsibility is to let go and let God. Right. And God's is to is to let go is to is to take care of them. And uh, in First John, one five through ten, John says, "This is the message we've heard from Him and proclaim to you." that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So our responsibility then is what? To walk in the light as he is in the light. Try to try to be true to that calling. And also to confess our sins, right? And then God's role is to forgive our sins and cleanse us. Pretty powerful language there. And I think if you read that passage, it'd be hard to fall in the, into the despair and hopelessness side of, of sin. Because, I mean, it's pretty powerful to think if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Yeah, that's a, that's a promise. God says, I will, I will, I will do this. Um, I need to realize that. It, it, once I realize that, I, that helps pull me out of any despair or hopelessness I have. It, it gives me hope again. God is going to take care of this. So maybe I, I fell down the ladder a, a few rungs. Um, spiritually but god is going to take care of that and i can start again and start climbing that ladder again and get closer to him again so there's hope and that that's part of the answer to people who recover from depression they start developing a hope again i was going to say ver something very similar to what scott just said he said it more eloquently than i would have but I'm a little uncomfortable thinking in terms of God's responsibility. 
And uh, I was going to suggest also that it's God's promise that we that is the um, source of our hope. And if we interact with him in the right way, then we have all those promises that he has extended to us through his word. That's good, Jerry. Uh, yeah, I admit responsibility is kind of clunky language. That was mine. Um, but it was interesting to just think about it on the back and forth. Yeah, we have that promise from God. So then why is confessing our sins to God then such an important part of receiving forgiveness? And I realize it seems like this is circular, but we are hitting different parts of this every time we kind of come at this. Um, well, it, it almost seems oversimplified even to my own mind uh, that I just go back to the beginning to the garden when Satan planted that seed that we can be our own gods. And I think he planted that so deeply in our flesh that it's always trying to control who we are and that it's always fighting against our total submission and just total surrender that we're not our own gods and that it's only in Jesus Christ that we can be made perfect, but in him we can be made perfect. And it just probably the hardest thing in, in our entire life to let go of, no matter who we are, is, is going to be that constant effort of uh, the sinful flesh to try and sway us so that we can be our own gods and we and we totally submit ourselves to god and then we finally have admitted that we can't be our own gods that we just can't do it alone that's awesome don that was very well stated so confession really is that act of submission and it really is saying that's our one way in the context of our sin of saying we're in submission. We're turning this over to you, God. I'm not going to try all those other things that I could try that don't work. I'm not going to try to earn my forgiveness or whatever and convince myself somehow that I could be good enough to make up for this sin and I don't have to confess it. Or I'm not going to be groveling and just be in total despair or whatever and keep on sinning because I because uh, I, I think I can't do anything else or I'm not going to hide it from you and pretend like you know you and I both the God isn't aware of it and that I'm not aware of it I'm not going to do any of those things that that I that I know or fail I'm going to submit to God and I'm going to turn it over to him um it's important to think about too that it, it and it's an act of submission and it is something we you know we have, we have clear guidance this is something we should be doing is confessing our sins to God but it isn't something there's no magic cash register it's not like we're we're paying our bill and we sin and all we have to do is go confess it and somehow it magically disappears. God's required to forgive it. That's not the, that's not the point. It's not, we're not, our, confession is not some secret way of earning forgiveness. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse that. We need to be careful about thinking about it in, the, in this way. But one way to think about grace and confession, I thought this was a kind of an interesting little analogy, is God's grace and, and our, uh, um, avoidance sometimes of confessing our sin and, and latching hold of that grace it's kind of like you know you have a rich aunt that dies and leaves you a hundred million dollars and the will gets read by the lawyer and it goes through probate and all that stuff and the money gets deposited in your checking account and you never draw a dime of it you just keep living in poverty um and um and that's kind of you know great god has extended this incredible this overwhelming grace to us and we have this tendency to want to ignore it and not latch hold of that and not take advantage of that grace and just continue to live in our sin or whatever, trying to think somehow we can handle it ourselves and not latch onto that grace and let it just wash over us and wipe away those, those sins. John, um, 
grace is the richest to me when I dig down to the depths of my shame and, and I'm part of the human condition that goes back to Adam and Eve. And I don't believe that Adam and Eve felt the shame that they felt because they did something bad. I think that they felt the shame that they felt because they believed that they were bad. Satan's script flipped the script on them and said, you are bad. And that's where the depth of shame comes from. That's the human condition. And, and the reality is, is that it's true. And for me to think otherwise is prideful. And I, I have to recognize that I am capable of Auschwitz. I am capable of murder. Like we talk about, I've heard it said in here that we've never murdered anybody. I, I feel like I have because if I can't, if I can't recognize the blackness of my heart that would hate somebody to the point that I would wish they were there or dead, that's no different. Wishing that somebody was dead is no different than killing them. I'm, I'm capable of that. I'm capable of putting my hands on somebody and killing them the same way that I am about wishing that they were dead. And when I get down to the depths of those things, I really think about who I am and what, how deep that is in me. And I recognize that then I've got nothing. I've either got total blackness and darkness and separation and nothing, or I'm blessed to have this, to have Christ in my life, to have this, this, to have God in my life and I get to discover that yes I am bad but I am loved regardless of that at a level that covers all that stuff and that's amazing to me and that gives me that gives me energy and that gives me hope that pulls me out of that place because I can do it all I had to do was all I had to do was see the depths of who I am and be willing to look at it and that's not easy and it's even harder to tell somebody about it because, you know, are they going to judge me? Are they going to, are they going to feel the way about me that I've felt about them? Um, man, it's, it's, that hasn't been easy and it never will be easy. And I think that it's not supposed to be easy. That's where I feel like um, suffering comes in. I'm supposed to suffer because if I suffer, I can reach out to God and ask him to take that away from me. And he is more than willing to do it. But if I can't let myself suffer, if I won't look at who I am, if I won't, take responsibility for those things then I walk around in this gray in between haze and so I have to look at that every day and I have to remember that I'm capable of those things and that's who I am but I don't it's not me that gets defined that way I'm I've been blessed I've been saved and God comes in and sweeps all that stuff out amen what a statement of clarity that was I in a statement of courage, Cody, may we all have the ability, the clarity, the courage to look at ourselves like you have just described. Amen. Yeah, so that was awesome, Cody. Um, and I like that. And I don't really want to rush this. We have about three or four more slides on this. And I think I'm, we're a little, a little past time already. I need to get upstairs and get um, sound stuff going for worship in 40 minutes. Um, I want to kind of pick back up on that, but I want us to think about one little part of that is are people bad or do people do bad things? Um, I think that's a part of that and thinking about that in a little bit of the context of what Cody was saying a little bit, but we're going to think about why uh, about this is the point Scott made next week we'll talk about, you know, um, God weeds us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake and what that really means a little bit and really talk about the power of confession in each one of our lives. But I do want you in the context of this, we're gonna come back to some of these slides, but think about this for homework just a little bit this week when you get a little quiet time um, in the context of you know bad people versus people that do bad things and, and uh, think about you know, this week, when did I sin? Why did I sin? What were the results of my sin? What are my intentions now? And let's think about that a little bit and come back next week ready to talk about a little bit more about, about confession and, and, uh, and really uh, grace giving us uh, space for regrets, but also for forgiveness and, uh, and living life anew. 
So with that, we will be done for the day. Uh, thanks so much for uh, great participation and discussion. I, I totally appreciate that. And uh, thanks. I hope you guys are getting as much out of this as I am. Thank you, John. Here. See you streaming here shortly. Thank you.